Aloha and welcome to The Creative Life, a collaborative production between the American Creativity Association, Austin Global, and Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Darlene Boyd, and co-hosting with me today is Kelly Odo. Kelly is CEO and founder of Unitas International. Kelly and our guest, Moko Mar. Moko is executive director of Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages. And the Honorable Judge Glenn Yabuno, all are descendants of camp internees. This is part two. Part one can be also viewed, and it could be viewed as a separate entity or flows nicely, hopefully, as we go into uh, production with part two with you today, with our viewers today. In the first part, we focused on the camp pilgrimages and their importance in keeping history of Japanese internment alive. And today we'll be talking about some of the legalities of, in, <clears throat> that necessitated internment or played a role in the history of the development of internment camps. And the goal, our goal in doing so is to get the meaning across of the importance, their, the, the extreme importance to keep history alive. And the pilgrimages are certainly one way. And we'll be talking a little bit about the implications for that were historically there for Hawaii. And just for your information, this all came about with a conversation that I had had with Kelly. And uh, Kelly was talking to me and telling me how moved she was as she visited the Japanese Cultural Museum in Los Angeles. And she had signed the book as a descendant, indicating and looking for her father. But more importantly to me, or what touched me so importantly was that Kelly was beginning to become emotional and she had talked and said, I think I'm going to visit my father's grave as a result of visiting the museum. Now, there are cultural museums elsewhere, some are more elaborate than others, but we know that there is a cultural center in Hawaii. We'll be referencing and talking about that a little bit later in the show. So with that, thank you, Kelly, for making this all happen, uh, serving as a host and producer in a way. You, you put this team together for us, and uh, I greatly Darling. And then uh, Judge Glenn offered to start us off, and I'll be turning this over to, to Judge Glenn, to take us through the acts that were behind this whole process, and he'll take it from there. So thank you, Judge. Well, thank you very much, Darlene, and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure once again to be part of this particular show. Uh, we talked about last time the internment camps uh, on in the United States, in the continental United States. And we also talked about uh, the pilgrimages and why it's important to continue to visit those camps uh, to remember what happened and to try to ensure that it doesn't happen again. So what I'd like to do is give a little bit of a history as to how all that came about. Uh, following the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, uh, the United States declared war against uh, uh, Japan. And in the spring of 1942, uh, actually, I believe it was February 1942, uh, Executive Order 1990-9066 was signed by President Roosevelt. And while many people believe that it was uh, specifically targeting the Japanese Americans, the text of the order itself makes no reference to any particular race. It's a military exclusion order giving the uh, authorities the uh, authorization to exclude any and all individuals from certain areas. It was used uh, primarily, if not only, against the Japanese Americans. But the language of the order itself does not specifically reference that. It references the right uh, to for the military to declare exclusion zones and then to move people out of those zones. So that's what happened uh, as a result of that order, is that uh, General DeWitt, uh, as the commanding general in at the time in charge of that uh, effort, uh, posted notices throughout uh, California and the western areas of that uh, state and 
declaring uh, certain areas off limits and designating what you needed to do to go to the initial assembly centers while they awaited building of the relocation centers. There uh, ultimately were 10 relocation centers built uh, throughout the United States, and we discussed those last time. Uh, and there were a number of assembly centers where people were taken awaiting uh, the completion of those buildings. Shortly thereafter, uh, a number of lawsuits were filed. Uh, one of the ones that most people have heard of is uh, Korematsu. Uh, Fred Korematsu was an individual who re refused uh, to relocate and challenge the law. Another individual was Mitsui Endo, uh, and she was specifically chosen uh, as a plaintiff in a lawsuit uh, because of her particular set of circumstances. Uh, Mr. Korematsu simply said that it was not legal to uh, enforce the order and report enforce the relocation. Uh, Ms. Endos was a little bit different uh, in that she was an employee of the state of California and she was forced to leave her job uh, working for uh, the Department of Transportation, I believe it was at the time, now known as Caltrans. Uh, and she was taken to an assembly center uh, and ultimately taken to a uh, relocation center, I believe it was in Topaz, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kimiko, but I believe she was sent to Topaz, which is in Utah. And uh, even though she was relocated out of state, uh, she was still uh, designated as the plaintiff in that particular suit. And her complaint or her uh, legal theory was that uh, she was a loyal uh, American, and you cannot indefinitely confine loyal Americans. And they specifically chose uh, Ms. Endo because even though she had a Japanese-American last name and she was, in fact, Japanese-American, she didn't speak Japanese at all. Um, so it was not like uh, they could point to her as being a, a, a particular risk, so to speak. Uh, so both those cases ultimately ended up in the United States Supreme Court, uh, and they were actually decided on the same day uh, with different results, realistically. Uh, in the Korematsu case, the lower courts upheld uh, the military necessity of excluding uh, the, the certain segment of the population. And they said because of military necessity, they upheld the law without going in specifically into the race of the individuals or anything else. They just said the facts and circumstances of that time justified the military necessity of excluding individuals contrary to their constitutional rights. And that was upheld in a split decision by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, there was a very strong dissent, but the majority upheld it. Uh, in the endo matter, it was a little bit different because what they ended up coming to the decision is that you cannot indefinitely confine uh, Americans who were obviously loyal to the United States. Uh, I believe they used the word conceitedly loyal. So it was obvious that, that they were loyal Americans and you couldn't indefinitely confine them uh, just because. And that is the case that ultimately led to the relocation centers being closed. Uh, both cases were decided in December 1944, uh, and the relocation centers began closing in 1945 and were ultimately shut down uh, towards the, I believe, September, October of 1945 is when almost all of them were formally closed down. Uh, so those are two of the uh, most significant cases. There were uh, a couple of others, uh, but those are the ones most people know about. And uh, one up upheld the War Relocations Authority, and the other basically said the War Relocation Authority exceeded 
its authority by indefinitely confining individuals who are loyal to uh, the United States. So that's a brief summary of how we got to where we are with the internment camps. Uh, I know Darlene wanted me to uh, highlight the fact that internment camps weren't limited to uh, the continental United States. Uh, there were relocation centers in Hawaii. And in fact, every island had a relocation center. Uh, Sand Island, uh, Ana Uli, Uli, and I, I know I pronounced that probably incorrectly. Kimiko was indicating I was probably pretty close. Uh, there was Sand Island, uh, Maui County Jail, uh, Wailua County Jail, often uh, those locations were utilized, and again, there were there was something on every island. Some held a number of people. Some held only a few individuals, as few as three or four uh, individuals. But they were used uh, as internment centers uh, during the course of the war. So it wasn't limited to just the ten camps in uh, the United States that everybody is familiar with. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Darlene real quick, and unless there's any questions. Uh, thank you, Glenn. That, that's very, very helpful. It was very helpful to me in trying to organize my remembrance or what I've read regarding the history. Um, I have a, I, I do have one, a couple of questions before I ask Kelly to spin off on this too as well. Um, was it true that there were also Italians and Germans that were interred? Yes, they were, but not in the numbers that we're talking about for Japanese Americans. Um, there were also prisoner of war camps uh, here in the United States. Uh, but 9066 was used almost exclusively towards the Japanese Americans. Kelly. You have a question for Glenn? Well, I find it. We spoke the, at the last show about how so many of our ancestors or those that were encamped um, did not speak about the camps or did not want to speak about the camps. And why now, um, generations moving forward, that there are so many that are attending these pilgrimages. And so, Kimiko, you mentioned before about rewriting history or what was in the history books then was probably uh, propaganda. And can you chat a little bit about that and the importance of why these pilgrimages and, and uh, focusing on history uh, and what actually did happen is important today. Yeah, um, I think that I, I kind of look at history different now than I used to when I was like in school. Um, in school, you kind of think of it like, here's what's in the history book. This is history and that's it. But, uh, you know, as I've gotten older, I realized that our understanding of history is constantly evolving. What we think was perfectly fine to do you know, 80 years ago, now people are, are would be horrified. And even the language that we use to, to talk about it, there's a, a, a whole thing about this on the Densho, densho.org website that talks about words and how, what the, the words that we use. So technically speaking, you, the use of the word internment only applies to non-citizens technically speaking. So when we say internment, you can say that for the first generation, uh, you know, the people who immigrated from Japan, but for anyone born in the United States, it doesn't, it does not apply technically. So it's, we have started to shift the language and call it incarceration, um, or instead of internment sites, incarceration sites or detainment centers or things, because um, they, it doesn't, if you look at the definition in the dictionary, a concentration camp is closer to what actually happened. And because of the, the, 
you know, sensitivities with the Holocaust, people, a lot of people feel very uncomfortable using the word, a lot of Japanese Americans feel uncomfortable using the word concentration camp um, because of the Holocaust. But, you know, in, in my opinion, what happened in Germany is those are not concentration camps. Those are death camps. Those are beyond uh, a concentration camp. So we all kind of need to level up one and and to to talk the truth about what it was that that happened and so there there's um like assembly even though the words that that glenn was using to describe which are the words that were used um you know assembly center uh relocation they're all very benign sounding right like we're relocating you of course it was against your will and you didn't get to pick where you went and you didn't have a choice so mm -hmm. that that was all part of like family then. yeah the, so that was all part of the 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 wording and so now as as we've moved, moved farther away from um the actual events i think people can take a, a a more critical look at what happened and actually use words that really do describe what what was uh happening to folks uh and not use euphemisms that are just you know very almost pleasant sounding, you know, camp and things like that, where, um, you know, now we would, we would say concentration camp. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable with that. But I think as time goes on, we just have to become comfortable with it because that is what a concentration camp is. Um, and what was the part of the part of your question, Kelly? I forgot. Do you think that we are uh, attempting to not rewrite history, but present history as it should have been presented. I I think that that there is a, a movement happening uh, now where people really are trying to have somebody from that community tell the story, tell the history, rather than having somebody outside of a community interpret. Because it's really hard for if you're not Japanese American, there's just so many things that you know you don't understand about the culture and about how people do things, why they do things a certain way, why things happen, um, why people are quiet, why people didn't talk about it. Um, you know, so I I think there is more of a a push now for for Japanese Americans themselves to be telling these stories um because there are japanese american historians archaeologists filmmakers you know artists everything right so why not have the the somebody that represents the community also be telling that history so i i, I think it's not necessarily rewriting it might just be refocusing from a different perspective all three and I, and I also think that as Kimiko was saying that we're trying to get away and tell the truth about what was the euphemisms that were popular at the time. Uh, an assembly center in most cases was the fairground. And in most cases, in those cases, they were the, the racetrack horse stalls that had been cleaned up. Uh, that was what the assembly center was. It wasn't, you know, a nice, friendly place. Uh, and then the relocation centers themselves, uh, even though they're referred to as the barracks and the mess hall and things like that, you know, it gives the connotation that they were, you know, decent places to live. You know, they were pretty much hastily put together uh, structures with no insulation. Uh, quite often, the only insulation was tar paper uh, on the side wall. Uh, there was nothing akin to what we would call uh, or become used to as a habitable building with, you know, sheetrock now with insulation and stucco or something like that. No, these were literally uh, wooden buildings that were put together with a frame and then black tar paper put on the outside uh, with windows and doors. So uh, there was very little insulation. Uh, the elements got in very easily, especially uh, dust and the wind. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to now come to grips with what was really happening and what it was really like. 
Uh, and then, as was pointed out in the Endo case that I cited, uh, there was information withheld uh, that the American, uh, the Japanese Americans were loyal, uh, and there were there was FBI records and documentation that that was the case, but that wasn't brought forth. Instead, uh, they allowed the the hysteria of the times to take precedence. Uh, instead of uh, having everything come come to light, and now, you know, we're bringing all that to light, uh, and you know, some of the cases even recognized it back then. But we want to make sure that uh, people now know it because it's not in the history books. You only get a very, very half a page in a history book in most cases, unless you do a deep, deep dive into. Uh, the internment. I, my, uh, you hear so much about the 442nd, the regiment, with the Japanese Americans. Um, you also, I don't think that many people realize that uh, young men, Japanese Americans that were interned, were actually uh, recruited from camp. And so my father was recruited from camp and to serve in the American army, and he served in Japan. This photo is a photo of uh, Gila River, where he was in turn. This was in 1971, I just found this photo. But he took me as a little child there. And so Kimiko, you were just saying that it hasn't changed much since 1971? Looks the same. Looks the same. And that's unfortunate. It. it you you hate to see that history wiped away right there, but but that's that's what happens over time. But it makes me wonder how, because we're talking about the Japanese American experience, but also how can this inspire action or promote social justice or a better understanding of those others it marginalized within society. That's a larger question, and one very applicable today, I, I believe. I, I would agree. Uh, I, I also wonder, or perhaps we haven't really talked about this, when, when we describe the situations at the camps, and I, I, I suspect, I'm, or rather I'm certain that it is discussed among your families and, and also on the pilgrimages, and, and that would be the loyalty of the Japanese Americans, as you Glenn and, and Kelly and Nico, you've, you've highlighted in discussion um, actually serving and, and promoting Americanism, but then the paranoia that came about must have a ripple effect in the family. And, and also the fact that each of you have mentioned uh, that you really haven't had much discussion unless you do see people attending these pilgrimages. So we're here to tell the story, and Kelly's inching in and telling a bit of her story and in our in part one, Glenn and Kamiko, you did, but Kamiko, what's what is your story? You are a descendant, were you descendant of was your family together that when they went to camp or separated? No, they they well, I should say so on my grandmother's side, my grandmother's father, so my great grandfather, was taken by the FBI. So he and his oldest son were taken um, and separated from the family. Everybody else in the family uh, went to Topaz, Utah. So that, that's where they were during the war. Eventually, my great-grandfather and his uh, son returned, were reunited with the family. They, they called it being paroled, but they're paroled to another camp. So they were not free. They were just put in to another back to the camp with the rest of the family. Um, so so that's kind of the the story there. But I, I, I kind of wanted to touch a little bit on what Kelly was saying and, and, you know, why this is important to talk about and to talk about it in, in a more realistic way instead of using euphemisms is, and, and I, you know, Glenn, I'd be interested to hear your uh, reaction to this, but it, Freedom and, and civil liberties are fragile, just like our democracy is fragile. And 
this could happen again. I don't think that I'm being hysterical by saying that this it could happen again to another group of people given the correct circumstances. And I think the reason why we want to share these stories is to make sure it does that people are are aware that this happens and can happen and to to guard against it, against allowing it to happen to anybody else. We talk about the, the loyalty of the Japanese Americans to the extreme of serving in, in a military capacity. Uh, but it would seem to me that it's important in telling this history that we mentioned it, it wasn't just hopping on a bus and being taken to a camp, it was leaving everything behind. And then what, what do you do? Is your property confiscated? Is your property, in the present day, we talk about squatters, uh, being as relevant as this week with, with stories that we're hearing, uh, being able to see someone's property just by the mere fact of going in and when someone's on vacation and taking over. So what were some of the experiences that you've learned from folks talking about? Did, were there properties there when they came back? Were they able to have someone shepherd? And if they had someone that was close to them, were they able to protect their property or were things confiscated along those lines? Uh, so it, all kinds, all kinds of stories, you know, 120,000 people, 120,000 stories, but, but there, are, I think the majority of people lost something. Everything. Some people lost everything. Some people lost the property or a brand new car, or when they had to get rid of their belongings, they had to, I, I heard a story of a man who said that his sister had just gotten a brand new piano right before and then they end up having to sell it for like five dollars or something like that um but there are other stories of people who had neighbors um white neighbors black neighbors neighbors all different kinds who were very uh instrumental in saving the property saving um or storing possessions like cars and things like that. So I, I do know a, a family um, whose uh, African-American neighbors saved all of that for them and they didn't lose anything during the war, which I think is pretty rare to not have lost anything. So they were very lucky to have had that family as their friends who, who protected their, their thing. And Glenn, what was your story? Where well, my mother's family had a similar situation to what Kimiko just talked about. Uh, they had neighbors who did take care of the farmland. They were in farmland country in uh, an area known as French Camp, which is adjacent to Stockton now. Um, and they were able to uh, come back to the property. Uh, they did lose some things that were in a storage shed that was broken into and things were taken but they did come back to the land and the property and the house. And, you know, some of their uh, possessions were still taken care of. Uh, my dad's family did not fare as well because he lived in the city uh, of Fresno at the time. He ran a grocery store. Uh, so basically he, he lost everything and had to start from scratch. Uh, but he ultimately did reopen the store uh, the whole family relocated back to Fresno in the in the same area, uh, and that's what he did. Uh, he continued on uh, after the war, uh, but as far as retaining things, they did not fare as well as my mother's family. Well, with that, we're we're winding down here, uh, but I I do think it's important just to quickly summarize that the whole purpose of doing this series of, of part one and part two was to do what we've been trying to reinforce in the last few minutes of our discussion. And that is that we can't let this history go and things could take a turn for the worst with, with any population if these stories are, are not brought forth and shared. And um, I'm sure I speak for a number of people when, when we say that we really have uh, those of us who live in communities and, and have the honor and luxury to live in communities with Japanese Americans we really do admire the valor that everyone has and the stories that people have, recognizing that we're not apt to talk. Those people that are even our neighbors don't always share those stories unless we really push and be proud on them. Um, so I'm very grateful to all three of you for doing so. 
And with that, it is uh, time for us to say, uh, well, let's, let's just say at this point, it's, it's time for us to close our discussion and hope that we'll have an opportunity in the future to do so. And uh, with that in mind, you have been watching our program on the history of Japanese American descendants. And uh, they've been, our guests have been sharing their stories. And uh, we look forward to the relationships that we have with the three of you and, and hope to keep in touch with you. And with that, I will say aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.